Hi guys, this is GSNO.com and I'm here with a review of the Motorola Moto G60S. So, fresh after reviewing and unboxing the Motorola Moto G60, we have the G60S here, which replaces the 108 megapixel camera with a 64 megapixel shooter. However, it gets a large battery with fast 50 watt charging. It also keeps a similar screen with a 120Hz refresh rate, which sounds quite good if you're planning to do some gaming. Now the phone is priced at around $200, which is quite affordable, and uh, we're dealing here with a handset which also delivers a front camera capable of shooting 4K videos, and it has its own LED flash. So it's sort of a mid-range phone for the youngsters who like to do a bit of gaming and a bit of vlogging. Okay, so let's talk about the design first and foremost. We obviously have a plastic back here and a plastic frame. As you can see, it has a striped texture here and an old school approach of putting the fingerprint scanner at the back side. The camera module is rather typical and the build is, I would say, pretty solid, but the bezels are quite thick, particularly the bottom and the top one. Now the device, as you can see, it's quite long and narrow. It's not very easy to use with a single hand. You have to gently uh, slide it into your hand to get to the top or bottom part. Definitely one of the longer phones out there. If you want measurements, a thick 9.6 millimeter uh, waistline and 212 grams, which are actually felt like more, maybe on account of the phone being so long. As usual, Motorola is providing us with a water repellent coating here, which is something they tend to do on most of their devices. As I said before, the phone feels heavy and the good news is that it doesn't draw fingerprints or grease at the backside. And in case it does, we have a bundled case. Now that we're done with this old school design, it's time to talk about the display that we have here. This one is a 6.8 inch IPS LCD with a Full HD Plus resolution. And the good news is that uh, we're also getting HDR10 support and once again a 120 hertz refresh rate. We can see now what the screen is able to do via this test. And I have to say that the colors are quite fine. They're okay looking, a bit on the cold side. The punch hole is also a bit big. Let's call it medium actually, considering we're in the cheaper segment. The screen may look okay indoors, but outdoors uh, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, the contrast isn't very impressive and the brightness is not uh, high enough for a sunny day. View angles also rather modest. As you can see, the image gets grayer as you tilt the phone towards the side. So definitely a compromise here to keep the price down. The pixels have an RGB stripes arrangement, as usual for an IPS LCD, and we did a brightness measurement and achieved a pretty modest result of 258 lux units for this Moto G60S. Now, even though it beats the Moto G200, it stays below cheap phones like the Oppo A15s and the Realme 8 5G plus the Poco X3 Pro. We have some settings for the screen, nothing fancy, nothing out of the ordinary, so if you go here, select uh, not privacy as I did, but rather uh, display. You have your brightness level, adaptive brightness, full screen, pick display, and colors can be set to natural or saturated. Saturated is default. Display refresh rate is either auto, 60 Hz or 120 Hz, and that's pretty much it. So an underwhelming screen, and now we go to the inner hardware where we find the CPU, which is uh, a MediaTek Helio G95, a bit old school, 12 nanometer and octa-core. And if you can't see it in this app, let's maybe try another one, this one here. As I said before, MediaTek Helio G95 is identified here as the G90, clocked at 2.05 gigahertz, gigahertz. It's an octa-core chip. It's also present on the Realme 7 and Realme 8 phones, in case you're wondering. And in the current case, it's accompanied by 6 gigs of RAM. Let's wait for this ad to end. Okay, so 6 gigs of RAM and also 128 gigabytes of storage of the UFS 2.1 variety. We also have a microSD card slot and luckily, no trace of lag, even though this processor is a bit older, 12 nanometer and such. I didn't experience any sort of slowdown, freezes, or problems with the phone, even in games. So gaming checks out quite fine in spite of the uh, modest nature of the CPU. Of course, I'm not talking about PUBG high graphics uh, fine, but playable. Now, when it comes to the benchmarks, we go here and we have a bunch of tests. Okay, so I'm going to start with Antutu 8. 
as you can see, we're just above the Moto G60 and Moto G50. We also are surpassing the uh, Oppo Reno 5 Lite and Galaxy A71. With this, with this Antutu 8 result, we stayed below the Poco M3 Pro 5G and the Redmi Note 10 5G. In uh, Geekbench 5, in the multi-core subtest, uh, we're above the Moto G60 and a surprising surpassing of the Asus ROG Phone 2. We also beat the Nokia 8.3 5G, which is once again pretty, pretty impressive. However, in this test, uh, we are below the Galaxy A72 4G and the Nokia X20 5G. When it comes to gaming and graphics, there's 3D Mark, Slingshot, Xtreme ES 3.1, just slightly above Realme 6 and the Redmi Note 9 Pro, and uh, as well as the uh, Poco M3 Pro 5G, which we surpassed. However, we are below the Nokia X20 again and below the Galaxy A32 5G. The temperature was fine, I didn't get any negative records here. In benchmarks, we got to 38.4 degrees Celsius, and in games, 36.2, so definitely no overheating here. Now, as far as the battery is concerned, it sounds pretty impressive on paper, 5000 mAh, 50 watts charging, and the promise of two day of usage from Motorola. Now, as far as the video playback is concerned, we reached 12 hours and 58 minutes, which is just okay, definitely no record breaker. It beats Poco X3 Pro and the Realme 6, it stays below the Nokia X20 and the Redmi 10. Now, when it comes to continuous usage, I am once again not very impressed by the 9 hours and 23 minutes. It's just okay, once again, it surpasses the Huawei Nova 5T and the Redmi 10. And check this out, it's about half, pay attention, half of the battery life of the Vivo Y20s in the same PC mark test. It also gets surpassed by the Realme 8 by quite a few hours and the Oppo A15s. Now the charging I had great expectations for on account of the whole 50 watt thing. As you can see, uh, it's 56 minutes, expect it slightly faster, at least worth surpassing uh, OnePlus and Vivo handsets. Also in 30 minutes you're at 71% battery, which is actually not that bad. Now when you go to the settings and go to the battery, you have quite a few options to preserve it. There's battery saver, adaptive battery, and also optimize charging and overcharge protection. Companies are now taking better care of our battery usage uh, throughout time. We're done with the battery. It's time to talk about the acoustics. First and foremost, there's an audio jack here, and then there's the singular speaker at the bottom. Uh, if you go to the settings area, you should be able to find some tweaks. And uh, you go here. You should have those extra options, audio effects, and you can add a bit of bass, a bit of treble, keep the sound balanced or flat or focus on the voice with a vocalizer feature. Now let's actually listen to some tunes and decide for ourselves. Keep in mind, the speaker will be very loud. Okay, a bunch of conclusions. Uh, so, not much bass here for sure. Lots of volume, that's nice, but there's also some distortion at top volume. I actually prefer to keep it at about 70 or 80 percent. Uh, not much treble either, but somehow the voices were, uh, were well heard in the songs I listened to. Now, we have here uh, some decibel meter tests. First of all, we achieved 88.9 decibels with this acoustic sample. We surpassed the first OnePlus Nord and the Huawei Nova 9. We stay below the Moto G60 and the Realme 8. Now, when it comes to games, check this out. This is actually pretty impressive. 102.1 decibels. Goes above Moto G60, Galaxy A41 and the Realme 8, plus even a few flagships. Stays below the Vivo Y20s and the Motorola H20 Lite. I think we're about done with the acoustics, so let's talk about the cameras. First, this selfie shooter is a special one. It's a 16 megapixel camera, but it shoots 4K video in 30 frames and it has its LED flash here somewhere. If you go to the back, there is a quad camera, not a triple one like the Moto G60 had. The G60S has a main 64 megapixel shooter with phase detection autofocus. There's also the ultra wide 8 megapixel camera and the two smaller cams, uh, 5 megapixel macro and the 2 megapixel bokeh here. There's the flash here and the 4K 
30 frames per second capture. The interface of the camera includes typical motor options like spot color, cutout, cinemagraph, ultra resolution, dual capture and night vision. And now let's check out the gallery of shots taken with this handset. Okay, so this is the gallery of shots we've taken. They were taken on a pretty sunny day. And I have to say there's a slight red tint to some of the first initial photos and this is the regular shot well this is the ultra wide shot as you can see it captures more space on the sides but also less details than the other one now uh, we have several more shots here and even though this looks impressive on the small screen the actual zoom was a bit underwhelming however lacking a telephoto camera this was to be expected there's a lot of noise after you go past two or three x several more shots here these images are imbued in white, that's my impression. There is a slight white hue to them, at least in the few uh, instances when we took photos with the sun in front of us, we didn't have many problems. So that's a plus. I love this yellow hue here, this is one of the colors which got captured in a pretty fine manner. And going further, we have some nice close-ups of this uh, fish mouth statue. One thing to remember throughout the gallery is that you'll be definitely more impressed by the close-ups with the main camera than by the macros of the macro camera. This is a regular shot and this is an ultra-wide shot. In this occasion the colors are quite fine and this is one of the successful ultra-wide shots taken by the phone. Now we go further and we achieve some colors here on the playground. Now I have to say that these colors are a bit too intense for my liking, particularly in the ultra-wide uh, fashion. They're, uh, too saturated for my taste and also the image is a bit too exposed by the strong sun. Some of the colors escape unskated by this, uh, for example the yellows and I would say also the blues even though there is a blue tint in some of the shots in the darker areas. Okay and once again solid close-ups, this is a close-up and this is a macro which was taken in a decent fashion I'd say. And now here come the selfies. And these are taken at a pretty low resolution as usual for Motorola they're combining four pixels in one and with a 16 megapixel camera you're taking four megapixel shots i mean they're fine and all but if you watch them on a bigger screen you'll definitely be disappointed by the details you have here at least the texture of the eyes the skin and the clothes is pretty spot on these are bokeh shots or portrait shots whatever you want to call them i don't see any artifacts or a wrong way of focusing so that's fine even though the face is a bit too white for my liking. Now a few attempts at capturing this cone and this is the most successful one, it's actually wallpaper worthy, captured with, you guessed it, the main camera, not the macro one. And even more colors here. Now this is probably one of the few instances where the color calibration and the dynamic range is spot on uh, with the ultra wide and the main camera. We got rid of that white layer on top of the image somehow, so the idea is to stay between the shade and the sun in order to capture better calibrated colors. And now some selfies without the hat on. This may look a bit more impressive because you can see the whole head but they're still lacking in detail on account of the modest, modest resolution. Just 4 megapixels combining 4 pixels in one. We also did some bokeh with the main camera, you can see it here, which actually applies it pretty well. Some phones will make this area between the arm and the body clear. This one detects that it has to make it a bit blurrier. Okay, and we also have this uh, capture in landscape mode. So if you're aiming for bokeh shots, you'll be pretty happy with the results with both the bow, the back and the front camera. Okay, let's see more captures here. A lovely blue hue, this time pretty well kept in check, not an exaggerated uh, blue. And uh, let's see what else we have here, several more close-ups and macros. All in all, this camera actually reminded me of the Redmi Note 9 Pro, perhaps a bit above it. It definitely needs to take care of its color calibration better, because sometimes it's reddish, sometimes it's bluish, and that's not a compliment. These are daytime shots, let's go to the low light ones. Uh, actually these were a bit underwhelming. I got to see to see again the Poco M3 Pro gallery recently and to be honest that one handles the light situation better here during the low light shots. Uh, of course if you're taking pictures without the night mode on you can definitely forget about achieving something worthy of social media. It's only with the night mode that you get decent results, not the best 
just decent. I've seen uh, many Xiaomi phones, cheaper phones, uh, which can handle low light situations better and have a better night mode. So all in all, slightly underwhelming in the nighttime department, the low light department, even with the night mode on. I mean, the best shot is probably the last one here. And uh, there was a time when Motorola used to be more impressive in low light situations. These have been uh, photo captures for video. We're going to have to employ the MX player and we have 10 videos. So let's take them one at a time. Okay, so first things first, um, let's see how we're doing in the panoramic department. There's a lot of light, that's for sure. The image is a bit shaky, especially when you're filming in 4K. In Full HD, it's less so. And there's a slight red hue in the area of the trees. The sky is an unnatural color. The blue is too intense. And here we are with the toys here. Once again, the colors are too vivid, too bright, too saturated on account of the sunny day and a lot of overexposure in the sky area at the top, which gets fixed fast once you point the camera towards it. Uh, just like it happened in the photo area, when you're in the shade and there's a bit of sun combined, you actually get decent results, but this is just Full HD, so uh, details are pretty slim. Okay, and this is a selfie video. Not bad. I mean, uh, it's, I would say it's okay for a mid-range phone but I've seen mid-rangers behaving better than that. I feel it's inferior to the Galaxy A generation of 2020, not 2021. It's inferior to those just slightly. Uh, at least the face keeps its expression and details at first sight. Okay, we have an ad here. And let's see another video. This is a stabilization test. We're descending stairs. And I would say it's quite shaky. However, the image doesn't tremble, there's no flicker here, it's just the obvious movement of the feet, that's it. There's no extra tremble or defocusing or flicker. So, in the end, not that bad, on a flat terrain, you may achieve even better results. Okay, so this is the focus test, switching for foreground, from foreground to background. It feels like a phone which could maybe rival something like um, a Redmi series device or a Poco series device. It's in there. Um, it also feels like it's below the Galaxy A51 and A71. Um, but in details, I would say that 4K details are quite fine. Stabilization was, let's say, decent, but nothing more than that. And these are the low light videos. Underwhelming as expected. Shaky, noisy, ghostly not something to brag about when you get home. So there you have it. The phone reminded me of the Redmi Note 9 Pro and that's the vibe I'm getting. At best, it can be compared with the Galaxy A51. Now I have reached the connectivity department and this one is a dual SIM phone with two nano SIM card slots. And I should probably also mention that the device doesn't have Wi-Fi 6 and also doesn't have 5G. It sticks to 4G connectivity. We also have Wi-Fi dual band, Bluetooth 5.0, an USB-C 2.0 port at the bottom side here and the GPS and NFC are part of the package. The calls were pretty loud and clear and we have here some tests regarding the connectivity. I'm talking about speed test obviously, so let's check out the results. Okay, so as far as Wi-Fi goes, we've achieved uh, 300 mega per second downloads and 323 mega per second uploads. And uh, this is the 4G test, up to 62.3 mega per second in download and up to 32.6 mega per second in upload. I've seen better, to be honest, but uh, it all depends on the state of the network when we tested the device. Now, as far as the software is concerned, no surprises here. We've tested a lot of Motorola phones over the past year. We get the exact same experience. We're running on Android 11 with a stock software experience, close to what Google intended, with the only change being this Moto app, the My UX, where you get to personalize your experience. Okay, settle down. So you go to personalize, you go to styles, and you got your fonts, colors, icon shapes and layout to tweak. We also have your wallpapers, then you have the gestures, quite a few of them, aside from those I'm using right now to navigate. 
Then we have the tips. If you're new to Android 11 or Motorola, you get all you need here. Plus, pick display and attentive display are here to replace always on display. Gamers will have this game time area with the tools, including one that allows you to record your gameplay session. And then we also have the media controls and audio effects. So that's pretty much it. Otherwise, we have the news feed here, to the leftmost area, and we have multitasking happening like this with the recents, and we, there's also the option of split screen, of course. Keep the screen pressed for widgets, which are obviously stock. And if you swipe down, you'll treat it to notifications and quick settings, including do not disturb, Bluetooth, uh, nearby share, night light, and a few more. Now, aside from that, the pre-installed apps don't feature any sort of bloater. They're just the typical Google affair, files fit. There's a Gmail, Google, I see there's also FM radio here, Google One, Home, Maps, and so forth. Going into the settings, once again, stock and standard stuff related to uh, security, location, privacy here with all the needed permissions, apps and notifications, display, digi digital well-being and parental control. And uh, if you want to unload the device, there is a fingerprint scanner at the backside, which is quite snappy and accurate. We also have this extra physical button here, which triggers Google Assistant. And I save something for the last area of the review, the, well, verdict. As you can see, Moto Game Time is now on. You have it here, blocking calls, no notifications, lock more screenshots, screen recording, and even Twitch streaming. So FIFA 22 Mobile has launched and it's time for the verdict. I'm going to play a quick game and tell you more about the pros and cons of the phone. But first, let's get to the match. Okay, so you know, versus attack is one way, but you can also play in real time, which is something I haven't done in a while. You can also drag this sidebar whenever you want. Is searching for an opponent right now, so let me tell you what the pro aspects of the Moto G60s are. The price is obviously one of the drawing points, the grip, the performance. We have a micro SD card slot and an audio jack, a pretty fast charging. The button speaker is quite loud. The camera takes solid close ups, nice bokeh. I like the details of the 4K video capture. And we have an LED flash and the 4K video capture for the front camera as well. Now, uh, there's also a clear and stock Android here, just so you know. And we're off to the match. Mind you, I'm not the best at FIFA, so uh, there's that. At least you can see the graphics of the game, the new generation of engine, which is being applied here, is quite impressive. And there's already a foul. Anyway, I finished with the pros, let's talk about the cons for the device. Um, now, the cons include, obviously, the fact that it's a long phone and it's quite a heavy and beefy handset. And um, I should also mention that the battery life, well, I expect it better in that area. And at the same time, the screen is probably the biggest letdown here. Definitely not bright. If there's one thing you could call it, it's not bright for sure. I expected more, even after seeing two Motorola phones with the same exact problem. And uh, I should also mention that some of the colors of the camera are a bit weird and close to gold. Okay, so long and heavy, poor display, uh, battery life is underwhelming. Well, we also have some distortion for the speaker at the bottom. We don't have stereo speakers. And uh, I should probably also mention the lack of 5G maybe being a problem. Poor selfie details, just four megapixels, poor low light in general, even compared to some older Motorola phones. I've seen better in that regard, and shaky 4K clips. That's about it for the pros and the cons. In the end, what puzzles me is the fact that we don't have a clear selling point here. On paper it should be the battery, but it's more the charging rather than the actual battery, because the battery life isn't very impressive. So that's that. Uh, it's more of an indoors phone on account of the screen, one for watching movies and playing games, but just indoors and not exactly future proof on account of the cpu but you probably expected that once you paid a certain price and we scored a goal that's pretty much it moto g6s is a phone 
with the fast charge as the sole selling point and one that you should keep indoors on account of the not very bright screen and the camera actually i would say delivers for around 200 dollars or below 200 dollars that's it from us hope you enjoyed this review goodbye